Well, uh, good evening and, and welcome um, to this, the, the annual University of East Anglia Keswick Hall Trust Lecture. Uh, my name is Lee Marsden and I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome you and to introduce you to tonight's speaker, the Right Reverend Philip Mount Stephen, the Bishop of Truro. He'll be speaking on the theme of unpacking the persecution problem. And I'm delighted to say that he'll be happy to take questions afterwards. I'd particularly like to thank the Keswick Hall Trust, um, and we've got uh, some of the trustees with us this evening. Um, thank you for, for making it. Um, and I want to thank the Trust for supporting and promoting this event and the events team at UEA, uh, led by Rachel. Prior to becoming the 16th Bishop of Truro, um, Bishop Philip was the executive leader of the Church Mission Society, uh, where he oversaw the operation of all CMS's mission in 40 different countries, leading a community of around 300 members and supporting around 350 people in mission around the world. Bishop Philip was consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, at St Paul's Cathedral, and then took up his seat at Truro Cathedral on the 12th of January 2019. The previous December um, in 2018, he was asked by the then Foreign Secretary, uh, Jeremy Hunt, to investigate how well, or indeed otherwise, the Foreign Office had responded to the global issue of persecution of Christians. The recommendations of his final report, um, which I believe has, has been posted in the chat, um, was published seven months later and these uh, recommendations were subsequently accepted in full by the UK government. They've made a significant impact on thinking around the world in this most difficult of subjects. It retains a significant interest in the area um, while also chairing the Church of England's Partnership for World Mission, the umbrella body which gathers together the Church of England's various specialist mission agencies. Bishop Philip, welcome. And we really look forward to hearing what you've got to say to us this evening. Thank you. Uh, Lee, thank you very much indeed and uh, good evening to you all. It is great that by the uh, the wonders of modern technology I can be sitting here in Cornwall as indeed I think many people who are attending uh, are and uh, join with you in uh, in Norfolk and Maybe there are people from further afield as well, but it's uh, it, it's a privilege to speak. It's it, it's an honour to be invited, and I, I do thank you very much indeed for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, before I start, I think it's only right to acknowledge that yesterday marked the tenth anniversary of the assassination of Shabazz Bhatti, the Pakistani cabinet minister for minority affairs and a practicing Christian murdered for speaking out for the rights of Pakistani minorities and we do right today to uh, honour his memory and remember the price that he paid in defence of freedom of religion and uh, belief and I dedicate this lecture tonight to, to his memory and to the cause for which uh, he stood. As Lee uh, mentioned I had uh, an unusual start to my Christmas in 2018 when I was rung up by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who asked me if I'd be willing to lead a review of the way that the Foreign Office, the FCO, had uh, addressed or otherwise the persecution of Christians. And it became clear that this was a request from the then Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt himself, who was very moved by the issue and clearly concerned uh, both about the human stories of those caught up in persecution and worried too that the FCO frankly just wasn't doing enough about it. To be honest it was terrible timing for me not having even started in Truro but it's a really important uh, issue too so I said yes. And so we set up the review with a punishing six-month window. Lee quite, quite rightly said in fact it took seven but uh, we set ourselves six months in which to report now, in the UK in recent years, we've had some huge judicially led public inquiries. Names like uh, Savile, uh, Leveson and Chilcot spring to mind. But this was definitely not one of those. To use an analogy, if they were full MRI and CAT scans, we had a thumb and a thermometer. We have taken the temperature and we have felt the pulse. But actually, as doctors know, 
you can tell a lot just by doing that. And while I would not go to the stake over every jot and tittle of the report, I'm nonetheless confident in the broad, bra uh, broad thrust of our conclusions and our recommendations. But why was it needed? Why was this review uh, needed? Well, it's now seven years since the Times published an editorial entitled Spectators at the Carnage. And it began like this. Across the globe, in the Middle East, Asia and Africa, Christians are being bullied, arrested, jailed, expelled and executed. Christianity is by most calculations the most persecuted religion of modern times. Yet Western politicians until now have been reluctant to speak out in support of Christians in peril. Well, happily, Jeremy Hunt was willing to speak out, and so we set the review up. In some ways, it seems as if the persecution of Christians has come out of a clear blue sky. It was a real issue in the days of the Cold War when Christians and churches in some context in the Soviet bloc experienced very significant pressure. Post-1989, however, it had seemed to recede, only to creep up on us by degrees in the intervening period. And there are two striking factors behind its re-emergence. First, where once it seemed only to be located or mainly to be located behind the Iron Curtain, it has re-emerged now as a truly global phenomenon. But it is not a single global phenomenon. It has multiple triggers and drivers. The second striking factor is that because the re-emergence of Christian persecution has been gradual and has lacked a single driver, it has to some extent been overlooked in the West. And the Western response or otherwise has been tinged by a certain post-Christian bewilderment, if not embarrassment about matters of faith and a consequent failure to grasp how for the vast majority of the world's inhabitants, faith is crucial to how they see themselves and to how they behave. Faith and belief are simply not a leisure pursuit, as we tend to see it in this country, but fundamental markers of identity, both individual and communal. At the launch of the review in January 2019, I outlined six reasons why I felt that the review, focusing specifically on the plight of Christians, was needed. And I think they bear repeating now. First, we have to appreciate that today the Christian faith is primarily a phenomenon of the global south and is therefore primarily a phenomenon of the global poor. It is not primarily an expression of white Western privilege. And unless we understand that, unless we understand that it is primarily a phenomenon of the global poor, we will never give this issue the attention it and they deserve. Second, this particular focus on Christian persecution is justified because Christian persecution, perhaps like no other form of persecution, is a global phenomenon. And it is so because the Christian faith is a truly global phenomenon. Christian persecution is not limited to one context or challenge. It is a single global phenomenon, but with multiple drivers. And as such, it deserves special attention. More specifically, it is certainly not limited to Islamic majority contexts. So the review was not and was never going to be a stalking horse for the Islamophobic far right. To focus indeed on one cause alone is to be willfully blind to many others. Thirdly, Christian persecution is a human rights issue and should be seen as such. Freedom of religion or belief is, I would argue, the most fundamental human right because so many others depend upon it. In the West, we tend to set one right against another. But in much of the world, this right, the right of freedom of religion or belief, is not in opposition to others, but rather is the linchpin upon which others depend. And we in the West need to be awake to such dependencies and not dismiss freedom of religion or belief as irrelevant to other rights. If freedom of religion or belief is removed, so many, other, so many other rights are put in jeopardy as well. 
And fourthly, this is not about special pleading for Christians, but rather making up for a significant deficit. We have been blind to this issue, partly because of post-colonial guilt, a sense that we have interfered uninvited in certain contexts in the past, so we should not do so again. But this is not about special pleading for Christians, rather it's about ensuring that Christians in the Global South have a fair deal and a fair share of the UK's attention and concern. So in that sense, it is an equality issue. If one minority is on the receiving end of 80% of religiously motivated discrimination, it is simply not just that they should receive so little attention. We did incidentalist criticism for using that 80% figure. It was cited by the International Society for Human Rights, a respected Geneva-based organization 10 years or so ago, but it no longer appears on their website simply because the research on which it's based is not current. However, in private conversation with senior figures in the organization, they certainly stand by it and suggest that if anything, the figure is now higher. And I note that our critics have not been able to put up an alternative figure. Fifthly, however, this is also about being sensitive to discrimination and persecution of all minorities. Perhaps because the Christian faith is the one truly global faith, it has become a bellwether for repression more generally. If Christians are being discriminated against in one context or another, you can bet your bottom dollar other minorities are too. So renewing a focus on Christian persecution is actually a way of expressing our concern for all minorities who find themselves under pressure. And ignoring Christian persecution might well mean that we are ignoring other forms of repression as well. And I want to also want to say very clearly that I want to distance the approach that we took in framing the review and its recommendations from any kind of approach that is simply an expression of narrow identity politics, which I fear could be said, for example, of the approach taken by the Hungarian government. And finally, to look at this from a specifically Christian perspective, the Christian faith has always been subversive. Jesus is Lord is the earliest. Christian creed. And those words were not empty, and they explain why from the earliest days the Christian faith attracted persecution. To say that Jesus is Lord was to say that Caesar was not Lord as he claimed to be. So from its earliest days, the Christian faith represented a radical challenge to any power that made absolute claims for itself. Christian faith should make no absolutist political claims for itself, but it will always challenge those who do, which is precisely why the persecution of Christians is a global phenomenon and not a local or regional one. The Christian faith will always present a radical challenge to any power that makes absolute claims for itself, and there are plenty of those in the world today. And I suggest that confronting absolute power is certainly a legitimate concern and policy objective of any democratic government. Indeed, the Christian faith's inherent challenge to absolutist claims explains why it has been such a key foundation stone of Western democratic government and explains too why we should continue to support it vigorously whenever and wherever it is under threat. Nonetheless, the focus of the review's recommendations is clearly on guaranteeing freedom of religion or belief for all, not just for some. To argue for special pleading for one group over another would be deeply unchristian. It would also ironically expose that group to greater risk by isolating them and unintentionally portraying them as stooges of the West. We must seek freedom of religion or belief for all without fear or favour. So I am concerned with rights for all, and thus I do want to acknowledge the significant persecution other communities have suffered. The Rohingya community in Myanmar have suffered grievously, and indeed I fear are under greater threat following the recent coup in that country. The Yazidis in Iraq have suffered grievously. The Ahmadis have been persecuted since their inception. It is right 
to recognize the suffering of Christians in India and China. But of course, it would be very wrong to ignore the persecution of Muslim communities in those countries, especially, of course, the Uyghur Muslims who have suffered appallingly. In many places in the world, it is certainly not safe to admit that you are an atheist. Jehovah's Witnesses have experienced significant persecution historically and are certainly not free of it today. And of course, Christians have also historically been the persecutors of others. I think with shame of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the pogroms, but this is not just an historical phenomenon. Some of the violence in the Central African Republic in recent years has been very likely initiated by Christian militia. And responsibility for the dreadful massacre of 8,373 Bosniaks in Srebrenica in July 1995 must be laid squarely at the feet of those who called themselves Christians. So in sum, I wanted to be able to justify the work of the review and indeed to found the work of the review, both on values that were acceptable in terms of Western liberal democracy, so that its recommendations would have traction, and frankly, because I believe in those values, and in ways that were commensurate with and indeed drawn from the Christian faith, because clearly there was an issue of my own integrity in this as well. And nor indeed, do I want to set the values of Western liberal democracy and the Christian faith too much in opposition one to another, especially as the one owes so much to the other? So then how did we go about the work of the review? Well, again, it's important to be clear what the review was not. To repeat, it was not a major public inquiry or anything like that. We had a thumb and a, and a thermometer. We have taken the temperature we have felt the pulse. But just as I would not want to oversell what we did, I wouldn't want to undersell it either. We undertook a significant amount of primary research, traveling globally and taking a significant number of witness statements from survivors of persecution included. And much of that evidence is freely av available on the website, christianpersecutionreview.org.uk. And I think you'll find that the link is in the, uh, in the chat tonight. So what then did we do? Well, first, we established a working definition of persecution. To quote page 15 of the report, in the absence of an agreed and much needed academic definition of persecution, the review has proceeded on the understanding that persecution is discriminatory treatment where that treatment is accompanied by actual or perceived threats of violence or, or, or of other forced coercion. Having established that working definition, I put together a team made up of independent members and people from key NGOs supported by staff from the FCO. And then we drew up a map of the global situation, which was published at uh, Easter 2019 as the interim report. Alongside that, as I mentioned just now, the team took extensive evidence from a large number of people in private witness sessions in this country and in many countries overseas. We conducted a survey of those who might have been expected to interact with the FCO overseas, as well as conducting a survey of every embassy and high commission, and we talked to, to various diplomats around the world. Additionally, we selected a few focus countries, so, to, so as to analyze the general situation there, and then undertook some in-depth case studies of particular cases of persecution in those places and examined how the FCO had responded, if indeed it had. We also compared the FCO response with what other countries and international bodies were doing globally to address the situation, as well as examining some key documents from the FCO itself. So what then did we find? Well, at one point in the independent review, I say that there are two existential threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities in the world today. One is climate change, and the other is the systematic denial of freedom of religion or belief in different places and in many different ways globally. That was not a conviction I had when the review's work began, but it grew on me as the work progressed. Indeed, I was shocked by the scale, 
the scope and the severity of the phenomenon. Now, I think we have begun to realize the, the critical importance of addressing the first of that pairing, climate change. It's high time now that we recognize the importance of addressing the second. But how and why do I justify that general assertion? The most chilling aspect, I think, of George Orwell's 1984 is the existence of the thought police and the concept of thought crime. Why the most chilling? Because to be denied the liberty to believe what you want to believe, and I include in that the right not to believe, is the most fundamental denial of human rights. And therefore, I believe that freedom of religion or belief is not simply one right amongst many, but actually the one on which so many others depend. Because if you're not free to think or believe, how can you order your life in any other way that you might choose? That is certainly what Eleanor Roosevelt, the prime framer of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, believed. It is foundational. And yet what we found is that in so many places around the world today, we see this right questioned, compromised, and threatened. So secondly, we do need to ask why the violation of freedom of religion or belief is so widespread and affecting Christians on pretty much every continent. This is, as I said before, a global phenomenon with multiple drivers, even though, of course, there are many who would like to attribute it to one cause alone. But if you lift the stone of persecution and look underneath, what is it that you find? Well, in contexts where governments are weak, and I'm thinking particularly of Central and South America, you find gang warfare on an industrial scale driven by drug crime. Often it is priests and pastors who are the only people who stand in the way of gangs who want to subvert whole communities. Secondly, you find authoritarian, totalitarian regimes that are intolerant both of dissent and of minorities. You find aggressive, militant nationalism that insists on uniformity. You find religious zealotry and fundamentalism in many different forms that often manifests itself in violence. And you often find those phenomena combined as well. In other words, we find massive threats to human flourishing and harmonious communities. And ultimately, we find in those things significant threats to our own security as well. So if we care about those grave issues, we should certainly care about the persecution of Christians and about freedom of religion or belief more generally. We can no longer say that this is a sidebar issue of a special interest group. These are huge issues that we face in the world today. And we have to face up to the fact that actually the majority of the world's population today lives in a context in which their freedom of religion or belief is at least to some extent compromised. And sadly, the COVID-19 crisis has only exacerbated this situation. Weak governments have to give all their attention to managing the pandemic. Authoritarian regimes use the situation to accrue more power to themselves. Militant nationalists tend to blame minorities for the ills that are visited upon them. And religious fundamentalism uses the current crisis as a cloak for increased persecution. These are sinister forces at work in our world today, with many suffering as a consequence. So the time for inaction and indifference is over. And therefore, as the report argues, if the FCDO, as it now is, took this issue with the seriousness it undoubtedly deserves, then it would simply enable them to do their job better by helping them better to address some very serious current global phenomena. So how then is the FCO as it was, the FCDO as it now is, how is it doing? Well, to be honest, we found that it was all a bit cure its egg. That's to say, good in parts, but really not very good in others. One problem we found is that many diplomats don't stay long in post, so they don't really get to know the country in the way that they should. And much too depends upon the commitment of, of individual diplomats rather than the implementation 
of FCO policy. Indeed, far too much depends on the commitment of individual diplomats. The FCO has something called the Freedom of Religion or Belief Toolkit, which posts are supposed to, to use, but many we found didn't, and some we found didn't even know that it existed. It requires posts to engage in advocacy on behalf of individuals and minority communities. And again, some do, but many don't. Many people we interviewed said that the FCO used to be better at this than it is now. Some diplomats sadly aren't really bothered by it at all, are blind to issues of faith and simply don't understand it. Thus, we were taken to task by some FCO regional experts for an unreferenced assertion in the interim report, which stated that sub-Saharan Africa was a majority Christian region. It seemed to us such a blindingly obvious thing to say that we really didn't feel that it needed justifying, but they disputed it. So in the final report, we did indeed justify it with a simple re reference to ready, readily available Pew research figures. And to my mind, that displayed a very worrying level of religious illiteracy, if not ignorance. A further example of this is in the approach that's been taken to the middle belt of Nigeria and the phenomenon of the conflict associated with the Fulani herdsmen. The standard FCO line certainly has been that this is an old conflict between contrasting lifestyles exacerbated by climate change. In other words, the religious dimension is significantly underplayed. But it seems to me that it is as naive to ignore the religious dimension of the conflict, and to do so is to ignore some very significant evidence such as that we cited in the report. It's as naive to ignore the religious dimension as it is to say that it is only about religion. It is a complex situation, but it has a very clear religious component. Indeed, there is evidence that the Fulani and Boko Haram are working in concert, producing a very significant security situation that must be of concern to the Foreign Office. But if you took the religious dimension seriously, from the word go, you could have anticipated that. If you didn't, then you wouldn't. And as the report argues, abuse of freedom of religion or belief certainly intersects with other key issues which the FCO does indeed take seriously. Alongside key security issues, you can, use, you can cite issues such as gender inequality, modern slavery, forced marriage, people trafficking and poverty reduction. So, for example, if you are a Christian woman in poverty in the global south, you are much more likely to be a victim of those things. If you belong to a minority community, you're much more likely to be a victim of those things. So if the FCO cares about issues such as gender inequality, modern slavery, forced marriage, as it says it does, then it should certainly be concerned about Christian persecution. And if it takes Christian persecution seriously and abuse of freedom of religion or belief more generally, it will also become more adept at addressing those issues. So our overall verdict was, could do better. So what then do we recommend? As I said earlier, if you lift the stone of persecution and look underneath, you find some very unpleasant things indeed gang warfare on an industrial scale driven by drug crime, authoritarian totalitarian regi regimes that are intolerant of dissent and of minorities. You find aggressive militant nationalism that insists on uniformity. You find religious zealotry and fundamentalism in many different forms, often manifesting itself in violence. So if we care about those issues, we should certainly care about the persecution of Christians and about freedom of religion or belief more generally. And that is why the recommendations of the review were as bold and far reaching as I believe them to be. And there are two main thrusts to them. Firstly, I argued that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office should promote freedom of religion or belief indiscriminately and for all, and not just for Christians. And I argued that for two main reasons. First, because to single out any one community just makes it more vulnerable, and we have to avoid that. That is why the recommendations warn against unintentional othering. Indeed, my conviction is that the single best way to protect Christians from persecution is to guarantee freedom of religion or belief for everyone. 
And secondly, it is simply not part of the Christian tradition to seek special favours. We must love our neighbours indiscriminately without picking and choosing and exercising or exercising any favouritism or making a special case for ourselves. As I said before, this is not an expression of any kind of narrow identity politics. We must love all, serve all indiscriminately. So the first major thrust is that the FCO should promote freedom of religion or belief indiscriminately and for all. And the second is that the FCO must address this issue more proactively and face it head on. I say again, this is not a peripheral issue that can be relegated to the sidelines. It touches on key and critical issues in this world today. Well, specifically, we made 22 recommendations. I am not going to th go through them each individually, no doubt to your great relief, but rather I want to highlight the three headings that they sit under, because I think those headings are important and perhaps uh, relatively easily overlooked. The first heading is strategy and structures. This looks at the FCO in the round, at the centre, and argues that freedom of religion or belief should be central to the FCDO's culture, policies and international operations. Clearly that is a step change, but in the light of what I've said, I think it's essential for reasons of national self-interest and security, leaving aside the moral imperative that we should do so. Now, under that heading, we did specifically recommend naming the phenomenon of Christian persecution and conducting specific research into it. That was perhaps the most controversial recommendation, and we had significant pushback against it, but I stand by it. And I stand by it for this simple reason. If you don't recognize the persecution of Christians, as a specific phenomenon, then it once again loses any distinctiveness and gets lost in a general litany of human rights abuses. And we're right back where we started uh, it, with the phenomenon overlooked and undervalued and insufficiently addressed. And we must not get back to that point. It is far too serious for that. Just as quite rightly, we've put significant effort into understanding the specific phenomena of Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism, so we need to accord Christian persecution the attention that it surely deserves. The second heading was education and engagement. And in that section, I encouraged the FCO both to up its game in terms of developing religious literacy and to use that understanding to develop religiously literate local operational approaches that take context seriously and endeavour to understand that context not just through western eyes because if you only see the context in which you're working in your own terms then you will never be able effectively to engage in it and the third heading was consistency and coordination now this has been in some ways the most controversial area and we faced criticism for focusing only on the foreign office and not on government more widely but to focus on government more widely was, of course, not simply not in the Foreign Secretary's gift, and it was not, therefore, in our terms of reference. But we did signpost some effective ways in which we believed the Foreign Office and the Foreign Secretary could lead across government. And frankly, this does need a cross-governmental approach that touches, for instance, on, on the work of the, the Home Office and the Department of Trade and Industry, to name just two departments. There are many others as well. But I'm delighted to say that now that that is just what is happening, not just the Foreign Office, but the government as a whole accepted the recommendations of the report in full. And that was certainly more than I hoped for or expected. And I was delighted, too, that the new government confirmed that commitment and indeed that the Prime Minister appointed Raymond Chisty MP as his special envoy for freedom of religion or belief. Mr Chisty took on the challenge of implementing the recommendations with real energy and commitment. And although he's now stepped down, his place has been taken by Fiona Bruce MP, who has a long track record of commitment to this issue and will, I'm sure, be doughty and resolute in the implementation of the recommendations. And they did indeed uh, feature in the Conservative Party manifesto for the 2019 uh, general election. 
One further subsequent development is also worthy of note. In the wake of the publication of the review, uh, we have established the UK Freedom of Religion or Belief Forum. And this forum gathers together nearly 80 different stakeholder groups from a wide range of backgrounds, humanist, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, Ju uh, Sikh, and others too, including Amnesty International. We li liaise closely with the all-party parliamentary group on freedom of religion or belief, as well as the special envoy herself. And the forum is deliberately action focused, enabling diverse stakeholders to make common cause on issues of mutual concern. An early example of this was Humanists UK and CSW, an avowedly Christian organization committed to FORB for all, campaigning together in support of Mubarak Bala, president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, arrested without charge because of his activities in that role. And I look forward to the UK Freedom of Religion or Belief Forum continuing to catalyze significant activity to defend and promote this right worldwide. I believe that now more than ever we must defend liberal democracy and the freedom it guarantees us, including freedom of religion or belief. It is needed now more than ever. We must stand against all those who would betray and undermine it through violence, through crime, through militant nationalism, through authoritarianism, through religious fundamentalism and bigotry. It matters hugely, I believe, to our world today that we should do that. And it matters hugely that we should defend those many whose welfare, liberty, communities, families and very lives are put at risk by those dark forces. So I hope these recommendations, the recommendations of this review, make a very significant difference in the days to come. I was proud to present them to the Foreign Secretary and deeply honoured that he commissioned me to do so. But this is absolutely work in progress. I called this talk Unpacking the Persecution Problem and I did so deliberately because it's vital that we do so. It's vital that we understand it and that we face up to it. In one of his first speeches to the House of Commons on the slave trade, as he presented Thomas Clarkson's monumental report on the phenomenon, William Wilberforce said this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. Well, we now know that this is a huge problem too. May we too not look away, but face up instead to this great challenge of our times, just as Wilberforce and others in their day did too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bishop Philip. Absolutely fascinating um, talk. I mean, I think not only fascinating, but challenging and uh, a real call to, to action. I'm sure we'll have plenty of uh, people wanting to to come in and to, to ask uh, further questions. I mean, first off, I'm just struck really um, with that sort of um, try really that two most important issues facing the world at the moment, climate change, um, but this issue is particularly about freedom of religion and belief and persecution in the world. Um, we haven't heard that um, as clearly expressed, I don't think, before. Um, and that uh, is something which hopefully people will pick up in the, in the chat. Um, Rachel, um, I don't know if you just want to explain how, uh, again, how people can actually um, go about doing that. Yes, thank you, Lee. Uh, so just a reminder, and for those of you who weren't able to join us at the beginning of the talk, on how to ask questions um, this evening and join the discussion. Um, firstly, you can post a comment or a question by typing in the chat. Uh, you can open the chat at any time by clicking on the purple tab in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, that'll open a sidebar where you'll find the chat and just type your comment or question into the text box and press enter to submit. And then we're also inviting our attendees this evening to um, ask their questions by unmuting if you'd like to do so. Um, 
if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, please first do raise your hand uh, using the raise hand button that you'll see at the bottom of your window there. And uh, once you've been invited to by Lee, um, you can then unmute yourself. Please don't uh, unmute yourself until you're invited to do so. And uh, please also remember to mute yourself and lower your raised hand once you've asked your question. Uh, do remember, you can use the chat feature as well to ask questions. Thank you, and please do ask away. Great. I think I saw one raised hand go up, but I'm not quite sure who mm -hmm. that was. Right. Okay, um, yeah, uh, Donna, Donna Burrell, would you like to ask your question? Hello, Donna. I have, I have switched off the ability to share, although Hello. it is now on. <laughs> Sorry, Donna. <laughs> That's lovely. No problem. Hello. Thank you very much, Bishop Philip. A very, very interesting, fascinating talk. Um, I'm really interested in some of your comments about the FCO. You described them, or some of the diplomats, as having a worrying level of religious illiteracy. They could do better, and we must address this issue head on. Can you expand a little more about that, please? What would you like to see the FCO do to improve their, their understanding of the situation. I know every case is different, every country is different, but if you can just give us a little bit more of an idea of how you, you would like to see them address the issue head on. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Donna, um, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I think I look at it under, uh, under two headings. Um, I think one, one of it is, it, 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 it's simply um, helping people to understand um, you know what what the kind of the the, the content the tenets of uh, of some of the world's great faiths actually are you know so if you're going to go to pakistan and you don't understand islam or indonesia and you don't understand islam if you're going to go to sri lanka and you don't understand buddhism you know you're, you're just not going to do your job as well as as well as you might if, if you if you understood um if you understood those faiths so i think there's um I think there is a, a, a simple job around educating people, people educating themselves, being educated to understand more about the world's great faiths. But it's, it, 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 it is definitely more than that. It's not just a sort of, you know, it's, it, it, it's somehow trying to get inside the skin of faith and understand faith, not simply as a kind of, you know, a, a set of beliefs that you might pull off the shelf as it were, but something that is foundational to how people um, how people understand themselves, how people understand their personal, how people understand their um, their corporate identity, and that that I think is the real challenge. Um, you know, it, I don't think we have problems in the West in saying you you know if you're going to go somewhere, you really need to understand the culture and get inside the culture. Um, but actually, you for much of the world, you cannot get inside the culture unless you understand the faith that is that has really significantly shaped um that that culture so i think it is a work of education and it is a work of education you might say kind of you know cognitively um academically but it's also about developing a deep sympathy for culture and developing a deep sympathy for the way that faith has often shaped that uh, that culture within which you find yourself very interesting thank you very much Mm. And just, just to follow up on, on that, really, um, in, in the United States, the Foreign Service have been having um, religious literacy training, I guess, for, for some time. And part of the problem that they experience is a secular mindset um, and a lack of buy-in. I mean, how confident are you that um, the FCO at the top, uh, top level sort of get it and also, um, you know, how confident are you that this will work through to, uh, to, uh, to on the ground as it were? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a very good question, Lee. And I, I think I would, uh, well, it, it just, just to answer it personally for a moment, you know, I, I thought that this would be a piece of work I do for six months and then put down. Um, 
but I think kind of having been bitten by it, you, you, you can't do that. And, and I think I, I just did become aware of how, how, how great this challenge is and how, uh, you know, having done this work and, and, and you know, for whatever reason, gained some sort of profile around it, I needed to continue to commit myself to it. And, and, and I say that because, yeah, I, I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be an ongoing challenge to uh, to try and make sure that, that the FCA, the Foreign Office, and and government widely take this take this issue with the seriousness I think it deserves. I mean, if I'm honest with you, I'm not entirely sure that when the Foreign Office agreed to all of the recommendations, they actually quite quite realised how how sweeping and and uh, and, and and broad they um, they they actually are. And people do talk about, and you know, I don't want to have too much of a down on the Foreign Office. They were incredibly collaborative and supportive. They knew that the Foreign Secretary wanted this done, and and they bent over backwards to help us to uh, to do the job. But you know, by repute, and I think with some justification, the FCO is a one of the most secular uh, arms of of government. Um, and I, I, so I think it's a. It goes back to what I was saying in answer to Donna's question. Actually, you know, there's a cultural challenge here. And and it's 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 about how how we can help the the foreign office develop its its, its own culture uh, in in such a way that it doesn't see the twenty two recommendations as something that can be just be ticked off the list, but is something about you know how do how do they move themselves into a new business as normal as far as this whole issue is 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 concerned. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Okay, other questions. Um, yeah, Keith Judkins, can you come on, Mike? All, all uh, the all the questions all are coming from Cornwall at the moment. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Keith. Good evening, Bishop Philip. Thank you again for for a very good summary of uh, of an excellent report. Um, and I think thank you for having the courage to say some of those things, or with the backing of others to say the courage courage to say the things you said in that report. Um, what I was really wondering was how can individual Christians and more importantly how can the officers in the particularly in the Church of England best support the government mm. in um, moving forward in the way you'd like them to move? Mm. Yeah I mean I, 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 mean, I, I, I think I, hello I think we need to we need to stay informed um, and uh, you know there are lots of really good organisations uh, out there who are who are advocating on this. I was sent a, a, a very moving video today by Release International. Um, in fact, it was the the secretary of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Pakistani minorities who sent it to me. And uh, Release International, um, uh, one of their programmes is is around encouraging people, helping people to go and visit people who are held in Pakistani jails on blasphemy allegations and you know supporting them and helping people to actually to go and do that just have the money for the rickshaw or money to take food into someone who's imprisoned in uh, in prison you know that seems to me to be a really a really very simple but a very practical thing so I think you know staying on top of it keeping keeping informed not turning our backs on it uh is is really important but it is you know i think it is um uh you know for whatever reason and you know i'd want to say by the grace of god uh this issue i think is on the political agenda in this country in a way that it simply hasn't been before and i think all of us as uh, as electors um have a responsibility to 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 keep it there so you know making sure that our our mps don't forget it um is uh, is is i think re really important keeping it on on their agenda there was uh, another message in uh, another um question in the chat from emma would you just like to read it lee and then i'll so it gives me time to think about it <laughs> okay Lo lovely thank you yes thanks emma um so um this is um there's a lot of rhetoric in the us today about religious persecution of Christians, uh, for example, around the closing of churches in the light of COVID-19. Do arguments like this make it easier or harder for you when trying to raise the issue of international religious persecution along the lines that you mentioned in your report? 
Yeah, thank you, Emma. That's a really, really helpful question. And I would say uh, it's, um, you know, you, uh, you can extend the point that you make to the situation um, in, 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 in this country as well. I mean, as far as America is concerned, you know, America has a whole founding story that is that is based on the, the principles of religious freedom. So they're so on the one hand, globally, they're very active in this area and very, very um, positively active, I would say. Um, but on the other hand, I think they can be particularly jumpy about it uh, when it's when it's in their own backyard. I, I have always wanted to. Um, to differentiate actually between the kind of issues that the people may face in the states or the people may face in this country um, and you know the egregious uh, violations of freedom of religion or belief that the people face in 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 other parts of the world and you know there there, there may be some similarities um, but in fact that you know the difference of degree between these things is is just uh, is, is is just huge and I think you know, as a Christian leader, I would say, you know, our responsibility is not to bleat about our own rights, but to stand uh, to stand up for the uh, stand up for the rights of others where we see those being um, where the, where we see those being uh, compromised. The, the, the one qualification I put on that is I do think we have to be attentive to this in our own backyard, but, you know, in an intelligent way. Um, if there is, for instance, a uh, proposed law in Denmark at the moment that suggests that uh, any sermon in the country that is preached in any language other than Danish um, should be submitted to the authorities, not for approval, but so they can see what the sermon uh, has been. And that clearly, <laughs> there's there's there's, a, there's an agenda there as far as Islam is concerned. But you know, the Anglican Church in Copenhagen would have to do that. Um, I, I think that's that's pretty concerning. So um, you know, I think in Western context we do need to to um, remain vigilant, but you know, let's not uh, let's not conflate um, you know the egregious um, uh, abuse of blasphemy laws in um, uh, in in Pakistan with uh, states in America telling churches they need to be closed because there's a high risk of spreading COVID-19 through them, you know, chalk and cheese, I think. Great. Lovely. Thank you. We've got another question from, from John um, in the in the chat. Um, it's a, a double headed question and it's going to really put you on your metal because you mentioned 22 recommendations. Um, what John is asking is um, what are the main recommendations that still need implementation? And then yeah. has the pandemic actually still implementation? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, the, the, I think, uh, to be true, I think all of the recommendations of the work in progress has been more uh, implementation, more progress made with some than, it, than in others. And I think the FCO would say some of them they haven't, uh, they haven't really uh, made a great deal of progress with. Others take time. So there is, uh, we recommended that there should, should be a Security Council uh, resolution uh, passed takes time to get that together but there is work on work going on 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 that security council uh, resolution i'm very pleased to say um I, I mentioned earlier that i think there are um uh, there there's a, there's a real challenge actually about recognizing how far uh, how thorough going and far reaching the recommendations are in terms of the fco culture it's one of the things i'm very pleased about the appointment of fiona bruce mp because you know, she she will not take um, she won't be fobbed off, <laughs> and if she thinks that the foreign office is not uh, is n is not following through to the extent that they need to, I think she'll be uh, she'll be very good at that. Um, it's very important to say that there's a sunset clause in the whole thing. So the last recommendation says that after three years, the whole all of the implementation implementation should be externally reviewed. So. You know, and that's going to take time. So probably in about a year's time, there's going to have to be uh, some significant work put in to seeing how the Foreign Office has done, and they mustn't mark their own homework uh, on that. Has the COVID pandemic stalled implementation? Um, I don't think so hugely. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that it has. 
I mean, if I can be slightly controversial, I, I, I think I was, um, I was hesitant about the merger of, um, of DFID and the FCO. I could see um, how actually uh, that could further the cause of promoting freedom of religion or belief because the uh, DFID was particularly faith blind and they did have a, a mantra that said, you know, we deal with people on the basis of need, not creed, which is, you know, I, I think is actually very religiously illiterate because uh, creed very often creates need. So I, I did have some hopes that that might um, that might prove uh, prove fruitful, but I'm very disappointed at the reduction in the aid budget budget. And I think if the if the UK purports to be a global leader in this kind of issue, um, and and purports to um, make a significant impact on on uh, on the world globally through its you know extensive diplomatic network. Um, I think cutting the aid budget in the way that they've had significantly runs counter to to that aspiration. We have a hand from Bill Lowe. We do, yep, for, so Bill Lowe. Um, Bill, do you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Um, you, you've talked um, about the uh, religious illiteracy in, in the FCO. Um, do, do you think something similar exists in the Church of England? So, in, in, the, in, in the pew, in the pews up and down the country, are people aware of the persecution of their brothers and sisters around the world? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's that's a very good question, Bill. Um, I think they are. I, I think they are probably more aware of it than uh, the, 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 the once there were. Uh, but I. I, I, th I think there's a way to go. Um, yeah, I'm. I, it, 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 yeah, it, it's. Um, I think. I think one of the problems of the church in this country, if I may say so, is that is that uh, we often tend to have, um, you know, really rather narrow horizons. And, and I, you know, I, I used to work as 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 Lee mentioned for. Um, Church Mission Society, and I, I often used to say that actually, uh, of all the institutions in your average market town, um, the local church ought to be the most globally connected of all of them, um, including including the banks. Uh, but I don't think that's a claim that will often um, will often stand up. Um, so I think uh, I think churches in this country, Christians in this country, being globally sensitised us seeing ourselves as global citizens um, is, is, is immensely important. And uh, I, 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 it's certainly one of our priorities here in, in the Diocese of Truro to, uh, to be a church that rejoices in strong, um, uh, supportive, mutually encouraging international links. And that is one of our priorities because I don't think that has been the case, um, uh, the case formally. So it, yeah, I think there's a lot that we need, we need to do. We need to see um, we need to see ourselves as, 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 as global players, as Christians. We belong to a global church. Mary, another yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, do, you, do you think persecution will come here as in other countries? Um, I honestly don't know, Mary. Uh, as I said, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm cautious about our kind of um, crying um you know blowing the persecution whistle if i can put it like that too much in this country i actually think that the best way for us to address religious illiteracy in this country and you know silly things like employees being told that they can't wear a cross and things like that is actually by sensitizing politicians and people in public life in this country to to uh, the seriousness of this issue globally. And I think the more we become sensitized to, to how important it is globally, um, the less I think people in this country, the more respectful of freedom of religion or belief, um, the authorities, um, employers, whoever in this country um, will, uh, will become. But I mean, in a sense, Mary, I think the question you've asked me is a kind of 
theological and an eschatological one and <laughs> and i suppose i ought to say yes probably but i don't think it's it's not something that i am there are many things about this country that concern me but i don't think that's one of them at the moment but who knows how things might change thank you do we have further questions what while people are thinking of those, I shall um, abuse my chair's position and uh, and ask you one myself, if I, if I may. Um, if it, um, you were commissioned to do this by Jeremy Hunt, um, by obviously the the, the Archbishop. Um, he's gone, and yep. and yet um, Boris Johnson has continued um, the, um, what was set out and has agreed to implement um, the recommendations. To what extent is this, um, I mean, persecution is not going to go away um, uh, within the lifetime of a parliament. Um, no. To what extent is there buy-in from other political parties? To what extent is it the Conservative Party idea? Um, or do you sense that the political zeitgeist has, has moved and that people are buying into the idea of, of freedom of religion and belief as important? Yep. Yeah, no, thank you, Lee. I mean, it's a really important question. Um, we, uh, to be honest, we attempted to, but got very little traction with uh, with with opposition parties when we were when we were doing the report. I mean, it, it was actually, you know, we were kind of going up to the wire because the the report uh, was published um, not long before the um, the results of the Conservative leadership election came out, and um, you know, obviously Jeremy Hunt was a was a, was a runner in that, and the the recommendations being being accepted were one of the last hurrahs of Theresa May's um, uh, Theresa May's government. Um, so it was a kind of free but fairly febrile time, and we were working down to the wire. So we didn't have much opportunity, although we did try to 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 engage with um, with opposition politicians. Um, nonetheless, I think my sense is. That it is on the political agenda, uh, irrespective of political parties, um, in a way that it uh, in, in a way that it has that it that it hasn't been before. Um, so the all-party parliamentary group uh, on it is 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 large. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, to my amazement, in many ways, um, you know, it's it's frequently referenced in Parliament. Um, so the the re the review is so it it has become something of a benchmark. And I think I think I hope it would be quite hard for people to to say, you know, we're, we're, we're just going to ignore that and, uh, and move on to to something else. I think it's I think it's uh, at the moment, at least, it's really reasonably well embedded, but we have to be vigilant. Thank you. Um... I was hoping this would be a meeting where we didn't mention this word, but um, it has come up. So in the chat, um, Maren has posted a question. Do you think Brexit will help or hinder your wish uh, that we should begin to look and think globally? I, that, that, that's a very good question. And, and I, I really uh, I really don't know the answer to, to it. It, if I'm honest with you, I'm personally slightly suspicious of the global Britain agenda because I think it sometimes, you know, what it boils down to is not the EU. I don't think, you know, we, we were a permanent member of the Security Council when we were a member of the EU. We had one of the world's largest diplomatic uh, uh, networks, as, 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 as we still do. Um, my fear about Brexit um, is that it uh, is that the horizons of this country will shrink uh, that's my fear um, I know that's not I, do, I genuinely believe that that's not what the government wants um, but I fear that 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 could be the uh, that that could be the risk um, and I think that would be uh, I think it would be very very retrograde if 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 that were to be the case you know, I, it, it is, of course, debatable. I don't want to be too controversial, but, you know, I did say in my uh, in, in my remarks that uh, I think um, militant nationalism is a real problem in the world today. Um, 
Brexit is about much more than that. I, I do recognise that, but there is a nationalistic component to it. I don't think it. Will, I think it would be folly to deny that, and and we need to. Uh, I think we need to be very cautious about um, how we handle nationalism. Uh, you know, there, there's clearly there's a positive patriotism, but an, a nationalism that is excluding of other people, that is rejecting of other people, uh, is precisely the kind of thing that is that has driven. Um, abuses of freedom of religion or belief globally. So, you know, I think we have to be very cautious and we have to be, we have to correct, curate the culture of this country very carefully, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, further questions? They're, they're not compulsory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, well, we've got one here. There we go. Um, Good. Uh, so, so Richard um, has, has posted a question which says, um, uh, obviously, thank you for your talk, but the church has always spoken of those who are persecuted to death as martyrs, which is to say witnesses. There's an active connotation to this, whereas victim sounds passive. In your experience to persecuted Christians around the world consider themselves witnesses or victims yeah yeah that, that's a, that's a that's a really um that's a really profound question richard i i have to say i think one of the things that has has humbled me more than anything else through this whole whole uh, piece of work has to has been to see how people have been remarkably faithful and forgiving in 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 the face of of what of what has been done to them i, I you may have seen the the interview with uh, asha bibby um after she was uh, after she was released and i thought you know this this was a woman of um a remarkable grace and charity and no the word victim doesn't sit easily with her but the word um the word martyr and and a uh, word you know a white martyr to use to use the language and certainly witness is is exactly what she was i think um i was in an event a couple of weeks ago to commemorate the death of the 21 coptic martyrs who were killed on the beach in uh in libya and who died with the name of jesus christ on their lips and i found that incredibly moving um you know that 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 they should do that and they were they were powerful witnesses um to their faith uh in 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 their death and you know as i say i i find that incredibly humbling john has a question do you how important do you think trade deals will be in helping to bring justice to those persecuted and it's a really important question john i think uh um one of the recommendations that we made was that the government should seriously think about uh, sanctions against individual perpetrators and the con this country now does have uh, magnitsky provisions uh, in in law that enable uh, individual uh, perpetrators to uh, to be brought to justice and uh, dominic Raab did quite specifically when he was asked in the commons as to whether they those uh, magnitsky sanctions would apply to uh, individual uh, uh, abusers of freedom of religion or belief, he was very clear that they would. But I think the issue that you raise about trade is is, is much, much bigger. And um, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge for the government. When you think what an economic superpower uh, China is at the moment, um, you know, what leverage does the UK have against China in the light of the um you know the appalling treatment of the uyghur muslims and 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 and, and other minorities too in um uh in, in 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 china you know are we going to sacrifice trade with china because of that you know that's a big ask i think um i think it's for me i think that's where a multilateral approach to all of this is really important you know if you get the Amer if the americans are on side and the americans have been you know, pretty trenchant in their criticisms of of uh, of China. If you build international coalition, coalitions with these things, then I think um, 
uh, I, 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 I think perhaps there's hope. Um, can the UK exert significant influence through its own trade deals? Um, I'm, I'm cautious about that. I'm not convinced that we've got the clout. Um, I think the appetite for securing trade deals is great. My fear is that, that there's pressure to do that at any cost. Mm. You mentioned about the leverage that America um, provides. Um, under the last administration with Trump and Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State, they sort of really did emphasize international religious freedom um, and yep. indeed have formed an alliance really of like-minded countries who are keen to promote this. And I think Britain has actually signed up to that. But do, do you yep. think there are dangers in that, um, in being so closely aligned to, you know, uh, to the United States, with, which has sort of a checkered history, I guess, in terms of this, in terms of political agendas. I, I, I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm. I'm more confident about that as being a, you know, a, a reasonably safe alliance. Actually, I mean, I, you know, we, we, you know, we, we all know. The, the kind of the rhetoric and and the the religious the Christian rhetoric that surrounded um, uh, Donald Trump, especially especially in the uh, you know the, the sort of rather torrid time <laughs> that the states had in uh, in uh, post election. I, I went to the U.S. Ministerial of Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, in the summer of 2019, I think it was, and. Um, one of the things that was really interesting there was to to see a uh, former congressman, I think he is Frank Wolf, Republican, uh, doughty campaigner for, for international religious freedoms, the Americans call it, and Nancy Pelosi, Democrat, Democratic Speaker of the House, sharing a stage together. Uh, and, and I think actually that there is much more of a bipartisan commitment to um, to freedom of religion or belief in the states than the, the might appear at, at first sight and, and institutions and I use the word advisedly like um, uh, the, the the post of ambassador at large for religious freedom and um, you surf uh, uh, so <laughs> I, I, can't, I can never remember what you surf stands for United States uh, Council on International Religious Freedom or something <laughs> like that yeah uh, you know those those are things that are that are um, statutorily established, uh, and 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 I think with pretty strong bipartisan commitment to them. So you know the nature of the ambassador at large will change according to the uh, according to the nature of the administration, but there will be an ambassador at large, and I'm I'm pretty confident that one will be appointed by the Biden administration. Indeed, it's they're required to do so. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Any final questions as we're sort of nearing nearing the end? I'll probably take that as a no when I'm teaching that um, you normally have to last longer than the the students sort of patients and somebody normally comes in with a, a question <laughs> but, uh, but last minute for yeah, the radar yeah um if if we haven't got uh, those uh, just remains for me to say um uh, Bishop, uh, thank you for a, a tremendous talk really interesting and insightful and um yeah, I mean, the chat will sort of no doubt uh, continue um, a bit on this. Um, maybe you could perhaps just as a parting sort of uh, thought, really, um, what can those who've listened to your talk tonight actually do to actually um, help this process of, uh, of uh, the religious literacy side of things, but you know, specifically around um, freedom of religion and belief? I think uh, you know that there there are some outstanding uh, there are some outstanding organisations in this country actually who are, who are doing an awful lot to to promote it. If I mean, if I can be if I can be biased, um, 
uh, I, I mentioned them earlier on. I think uh, CSW are an amazing organization because they are an avowedly Christian organization, deeply committed to, uh, to promoting freedom of religion or belief um, globally. Open Doors, fantastic organization. Get, get on these people's mailing list, uh, you know, find, find out what's going on and, uh, and you know, be, be, a, be, a part, be a part of making the change happen. They're, they're a great gift of really years in this country that we can uh, uh, take advantage of and benefit from. Thank you. And thank you for your part in making change happen. Um, really appreciate your talk and your, your time. Um, and that, we'll you. all give you a virtual round of applause. Um, so <laughs> thank, you. thank you very That's much. A nice in the chat. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks very much.